We do want to see more of how amazing you are in your word. And we pray, Lord, that you'd open our eyes to see these truths, that we would uh, know more deeply the power of your, your gospel, your saving power. Father, we pray that the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you. So as we open your word, Lord, help us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, tonight we have the second in our, our new series we started a month or so ago, uh, looking at what is really the gospel expressed unknowingly by Jesus' enemies. So in our first instalment, we looked at the accusation that was directed towards Jesus, that he's always seeming to be in the company of people of low moral fibre. The, the, the quote there, he welcomes sinners, said in disgust, said in derision, cried by Jesus' enemies. And we who've come to understand the good news of the gospel say, yes, how wonderful, thank God he does, otherwise no one would ever be able to come to him for salvation. He welcomes sinners. Well, now we're going to look at a second statement uh, and it was, um, this time it's made by the great high priest in Jerusalem, the head of the Sanhedrin himself, this man Caiaphas. We just had it read to us. So you'll, you will find it helpful to have John chapter 11 open in front of you, so please do that. Okay. Now, the, the Mesoamerican Aztec civilization practiced human sacrifice for centuries, and they were still doing so when the first European explorers arrived in the 16th century. Now, as far as I can ascertain, having read about this this week as much as I can, uh, one major reason that they did this was on the basis of their beliefs and on legends that had been taught, telling that their gods had actually sacrificed themselves so that they could live, so that the people could live. And so then the people were indebted to them and needed to reciprocate and to give this service to the gods, giving their lives up for them. Now, modern scholars, when you read them, uh, like to claim that these sacrifices, largely these sacrifices were willing sacrifices, albeit, you know, with a background of some serious indoctrination going on, from childhood onwards, but these were willing sacrifices, these people giving their lives to the gods. The victim would stand atop a great temple. You've got a picture there, which, uh, you know, when the first explorers came, they saw pictures like this. The victim would stand atop a great temple pyramid, and a priest would then cut their heart out of their chest, sorry children, and hold it aloft, Indiana Jones style, before then pushing the victim down the pyramid. Uh, that seems pretty gratuitous to me. Uh, it's one of those things, you, you, you read it and you think, well, sign me up, you know, I'll be a willing sacrifice on that, sure. But how are we actually to square this claim of these people being willing sacrifices with the fact that in 2008, archaeologists digging around the temple of the Aztec rain god in what is Mexico City today found that 66% of the sacrificial remains at, at, that, at that particular temple were actually discovered to belong to children under three years old. Consensual? Really? Now, I'm sure that the argument of the day to, to do this atrocity for, for generations was probably similar to what we have in our text. The argument would be, Better that these few die than that the people suffer through a lack of rain and no crops and starvation. Better we sacrifice these few for the many, right? Now, there appears to be some logic in this if, if, you, if, you're, if you give us a given that the gods actually exist. But logic doesn't make very good ethics, right? Some of you will no doubt be familiar with the trolley problem. I know our kids came across this at school, come across this, the trolley problem. Here's, here's a picture for you. What do you do in this situation? So you are the man by the switch there at the top in the middle, yeah? 
The tram is coming. The brakes have failed. The decision is in your hands. Do you do nothing and allow the group on the tracks to die, or do you act and by your actions seal the fate of the one? Which do you do? Now, most people agree, apparently, on surveys, when this has been done, that they would activate the switch. Most people go for that. It's the utilitarian option, as they call it, because it results in the least loss of life. But interestingly, if you then present them with what's now called the footbridge dilemma and add that to it, they choose the other way around. They wouldn't. They wouldn't do this. So if there were, this goes, if there was a footbridge over the track and you were standing next to a big guy that you could tip over onto the rails in front of the, the runaway tram and stop it, they would not do that. That's interesting, isn't it? I don't know what these philosophers do. This is, this, is like, this is how they spend their days, thinking these things, these ethicists and philosophers. Okay, this is known as the deontologist option. That is, the ethical rightness of an action depends not on what consequences it brings, but on the rightness of the act itself to push, up, to push someone under the tracks. So why this discrepancy? Well, the ethicists debate... But it seems to me it's because the second option makes things very, very personal, doesn't it? You have to actually push a guy. And I would suggest to you that we instinctively know that if that is indeed a viable solution, you know, if a body falling onto the tracks would actually save the group, then it should be you jumping off the track, off, off the footbridge, not pushing a stranger right? We kind of instinctively know that must be right. So it seems to me there's a fundamental difference then between killing one man that many might live and one man laying down his life for the sake of many. Heroes of war are not celebrated because they were forced out in front of the enemy machine gun fire. They're celebrated because they willingly volunteered their lives for the liberation of others. Indeed, Jesus says it, doesn't he? Greater love has no man than this, than that he lays down his life for his friends. But look, see, either way, with, with this trolley problem thing, that problem demonstrates just how hard it is to make some ethical decisions, especially as a a kind of a detached authority on behalf of the many, right? That's hard stuff. That's difficult to make these hard decisions. But this is interesting. When faced with a somewhat similar decision in our text, Caiaphas, in John 11, thinks it's actually child's play. It's obvious. It's simple. That's how it comes across, isn't it? Did you, did you see? His words are pretty shocking. Take a look at them. He's addressing a gathering of the highest Jewish court. He's got in front of him 70 of the most important movers and shakers in Jerusalem. And you read in verse 49 there, then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all, he says to them. You do not realize it's better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Now, what's led to that outburst from Caiaphas? Well, we'll find out in just a moment as we look at these verses tonight. What we're going to see, breaking it up into three chunks, which, which we like to do, is what we're going to see here is a serious problem, the first point, as the following that Jesus is attracting starting to become a concern for the religious leaders in Israel. So we have a serious problem, and then we have a, a shocking proposal as their leader, Caiaphas here, suggests a disturbing solution. And thirdly, then, a stunning prophecy as this text ends and we discover that he, Caiaphas, speaks far, far better than he knows and probably ever will. So let's start then with a serious problem. Before we get into the text, it's helpful then, this is why having your Bible open on your lap is really helpful, just to glance back at what has actually led to this meeting of the Sanhedrin. Why have they been summoned together? Well, it's in the first half of, of, of John chapter 11. And Jesus has, and I don't think it's any under, uh, overstatement here to say that Jesus has performed the most amazing miracle. Absolutely stunning. Take it in. 
you're probably familiar, just take it in one more time. One of Jesus' close friends, a man named Lazarus, has sent for him because he's very, very sick. But, but instead of immediately going to Lazarus, Jesus waits a further, well, he waits a further four days. It's far too late. So that when he comes to Bethany, Lazarus has been in the grave for four days. Dead and buried for four days. Get that. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, they're grieving when Jesus arrives. They do not understand the reason for Jesus' delay. Everyone's thinking it. Surely, if he'd just come sooner, their friend, you know, Jesus, the great healer, surely he would have been able to save him from this fate, to save everybody from this misery. And being close to Jerusalem, literally the whole, you know, literally in the Jerusalem suburbs, really, Bethany, yeah? Many visitors have come to grieve with the sisters. Uh, and there's this huge gathering that follows them to the tomb when Jesus arrives. And it's all very public, mark that. It's, it's near the big city, there's lots of people, it's very public. And, and Jesus weeps at the graveside in front of them. And people, the crowds are saying, look at how much he loved his friend. And then he issues the command, take away the stone. And that's a surprising thing to say at the tomb side, isn't it? He's saying, unseal the tomb, open it up. And Martha is immediately anxious because she knows that we've got four days of decomposition inside there. It's going to be horrible. But Jesus consoles her and then lifts his eyes up in prayer. And then he issues a second command. Lazarus, come out. And from the darkness emerges this man, alive. And it's public. And it's irrefutable. Here is the man standing in his grave clothes. You know, it'll have been an event that anyone who was there would never forget. They'll be bursting with the information. That's what we get at the beginning of our reading. Jesus has just demonstrated authority over the grave. That is stunning. I showed you this picture on Easter Sunday this year. It still intrigues me. Have a look at this. Uh, Here you've got supposedly the tomb of Lazarus. And there's no reason to actually doubt it. This is the final resting place of Lazarus. Not in Bethany. This is in Cyprus, on the island of Cyprus where he died the second time. And it bears a simple inscription, apparently, at the grave. Lazarus, four days dead, friend of Christ. Stunning. Now, what impact does this have on the crowds? This is a huge thing, isn't it? Verse 45 tells us the impact and its wider consequences. Have a look. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. This was the clincher for them. Everything just lined up for them. That's who he is. Look who he is. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here's this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now, step back just for a minute at, at, this, at this meeting here. Think about the scene that we have here. This is a gathering of all the important and religious Jews, the Sanhedrin. It's the highest court the highest Jewish court. And most, if not all of them, at at least officially, are waiting for God's Messiah, right? We're kind of familiar with that idea, yes? The people are waiting for for God's rescuer to come, prophesied in the Old Testament. Most of these men, I mean, they know the Scriptures. They've got to be waiting at some level, at least giving the pretense that that's their exciting expectation. What are they looking for in a Messiah? Well, someone who stands out as being approved of and sent by God and who does many wondrous things. That's their hope. That's their expectation. 
Only God can open the eyes of the blind and cleanse lepers and restore legs and feed the multitudes with a couple of fish and raise the dead. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? So this is, at, at the very least, this is God's man that they're, that they're talking about here. It's hard to argue with the evidence. They've tried, actually. They've tried, and it's fallen apart every time they've tried. This is a man approved of God. This is, this is God acting through this man. And so how do these scholars and priests and leaders respond to the exciting things happening in their very own country? And this irrefutable evidence all around them. Verse 48, if we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. We should get the shock of that, actually. It's so inconsistent. Why? Why would they respond that way? Why do they see Jesus as a problem rather than the great solution for them and for their nation? Well, it's because, I, I, I would argue, it's because they're taken up with this world, actually. Now look at it. It's because their great fear is that if everybody rallies behind Jesus as the Messiah, it's going to somehow spark off uh, some sort of Zionist frenzy, uh, and there'll be an uprising against Rome, and then that will inevitably lead to the eradication of their nature, of, the, of their nation, oh, and also to the loss of their place in it, right? Caiaphas himself had actually been given his position as the high priest by the Roman governor, the one who preceded Pilate. It was given to him, this, this position. Now, was this a valid fear? Was it a valid fear that this could happen? Well, yes, actually. I mean, in actual fact, in chapter 18, we'll meet Barabbas, uh, you know, one of, one of many revolutionaries who were, who were trying to kick up a fuss against the Romans. So this was a very real, it's a very real concern that they're concerned with here. And actually, after the Bar Kokhba revolt, the third Jewish war in, in 135 AD, eventually, because of this sort of a situation, the Jews were crushed, enslaved, deported, they were banned from having residence in Jerusalem itself. And to crown it all, the Roman authorities actually removed Judea from the map. They renamed the territory Syria, Palestina, Palestine. This is precisely what they wanted to avoid. They could see it coming. It begs the question then, if not the liberation of the nation and the defeat of Rome, then what did they actually think Messiah would accomplish? And anyway, this, this gathering of the highest court of the nation, why are they there? They're there to discuss this Jesus problem. He's a problem to them. They've tried discrediting him. They've tried accusing him of blasphemy. Nothing seems to stick, and the crowds just keep growing. So what are they to do then to secure their future, to secure the safety of the nation and their position within it? Well, it's at this point that a voice rises above the hubbub, and we hear a shocking proposal. Look at verse 49. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up, you know nothing at all, you do not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. The answer is simple. This man, this threat to our position must die. It's nothing personal, you understand. His death is simply the best thing for our nation. Better that he die. Now, Caiaphas, no doubt, thought himself very, very wise to be bringing this situation this, 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 uh, this advice. Making the big decisions. Maybe he had in mind the story of, of Sheba in the Old Testament. Do you know that story? It's in 2 Samuel 20. You can miss it if you don't pay attention. It's in the latter years of King David. 
There's a, there's a man named Sheba, which is, I've got to say, is an odd name for a bloke. Okay, it's more what you call a cat, isn't it? Sheba. Sheba rebels against King David. And he manages to persuade all the tribes, all apart from Judah, to actually return home, to, 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 to reject David as their king, to give up their allegiance to him. And then Sheba himself runs away, and he runs to the safety of a city called Abel Beth Marker. And David's troops, led by Joab, they go in pursuit and lay siege to the city. Do you know this story? It's a good one. Abel Beth Marker was actually was a, was a place renowned for wisdom. You know, it's, it's a place you went to ask your questions and to get answers, you know, to get problems solved. And there's a wise woman from the city who summons Joab, the commander, and strikes a deal with him. She says something like this. Why destroy the city? You're bashing at the walls. Why do this to a beautiful city? Why destroy us, destroy the city? Stop battering the, the walls, and what we will do is we will throw this man's head to you from the walls. And indeed they do. And Joab does turn away and the city is spared. It's wisdom, isn't it? That's the wise woman. One of, one of only two references to wise woman in the Bible. Look them up. Great. Caiaphas is proposing a similar solution, actually, when you look at it, on the face of it. Why should Israel suffer for this man? Except that Jesus is an innocent and a good man. Jesus is not a rebel. It's actually, his solution comes from a heart of, of, of self-interest, of failure to recognize who Jesus is. And so in that sense, it may be dressed up in the human wisdom of, you know, utilitarian pragmatism, you know, the ends justifies the means, but it's actually, it's actually selfish and it's ignorant it's actually evil. But this utterance was, unbeknownst to Caiaphas, actually quite profound. And John picks up on it. Because in it, yet again, we see the heart of the gospel, the actual heart of the gospel here. It is, in fact, a stunning prophecy. And we'll see that in these last few verses. As John points this stuff out for the reader, look at verse 51 with me. John adds commentary here. He did not say this on his own. Caiaphas doesn't say this on his own. Something's working behind the scenes. But as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day, they plotted to take his life. And so fascinatingly, actually, even though these men seem to have failed to grasp what the Messiah was all about, as most people seem to have failed to grasp it, and also, though, in their case, failed to believe that he could actually do even what they thought the Messiah was all about, Caiaphas, nonetheless, actually prophesies about what the true nature of Messiah will be, what it really means to be Messiah. He may never have understood the significance of what he said to his dying days. But what he says is absolutely on the money because it's God speaking through, them, through him. Caiaphas saw Jesus' death as a solution for national security, a way of keeping on the right side of Rome, right? But God intended this utterance as a forecast of the execution of his plan to save mankind, a way for the human race to be on the right side of our creator. So much bigger than what he thought, isn't it? First of all, analyzing his prophecy here, first of all, the death of this man was indeed necessary. It is better for all of us, for you and I too, the problem then is real. And this is the only solution. It is indeed a necessary thing for Jesus to die rather than for us to. If he did not, it would be you and I. Why? 
Because all of us have sinned. And because the wages of sin is death. That puts it in a nutshell. All of us have disobeyed and disregarded what God says is right and wrong, and therefore we are, by definition, rebels against God. We're in rebellion. All of us are this way from birth. In fact, King David goes so far as to say in Psalm 51, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. The point is, actually, without getting into that even, is that our problem goes, it goes way back to our origin. It goes back to day one. And like a disease that we're born with, we see it breaking out on the surface in what we do and what we think and what we say in our lives every day. So we deserve the death penalty. The sentence of death from God hangs over us. And surely it would be better for us if someone else paid for us, paid it. Secondly, a substitute to take our place so that we are saved is indeed what we most desperately need and most certainly need. Now, I don't know why people think the word substitution is hard to understand. I remember when I was... Uh, starting a youth ministry, so, oh, you've got to you've got to really illustrate and you know work on that word. Kids won't understand substitute. I think they understand it perfectly clearly. I mean, we all ha- know what a substitute teacher is, don't we? You know what a substitute teacher is. We all know we all know what a substitute is when they come on on a football match. A substitute stands in and takes the place of the person that should be there. It's as simple as that, isn't it? Well, Caiaphas's maths were simple. This one man can stand in for the nation. He can be their substitute of the nation. It's a good trade. You know, see, the, the problem here is that might work in politics, uh, but it, it doesn't really work in the law court, does it? <laughs> one man. I mean, imagine that. Imagine a judge who would let one man who volunteered take the place of everyone in the penitentiary. In the penitentiary. So, you know what, I, I'm, a, I'm a good man, judge, just let 300 and whatever people go and I'll take their place. No, no, you can't really do that, can you? When it comes to justice, all men are of equal value, really. So one human life is worth one human life. Except that Jesus' life was different. This is what makes him special. Caiaphas didn't realise it, but Jesus' life was uniquely valuable. Uniquely valuable. Jesus is the only being in the universe who could do what he did. The only one who could give his life as a ransom for many. That was his purpose, wasn't it? Now, why is that? Well, first off, what makes his life unique is it was perfect. His life was absolutely flawless. He was completely sinless. He was not born in sin and he never committed any sin. He was a spotless sacrifice. And B, because he was not merely a man. The mystery and the wonder of the incarnation is that in Jesus Christ, God became flesh. That is is stunning. He had two natures. He has two natures. He is man. Yes, fully man. And God, fully God. And it was essential that he became fully man, if for no other reasons than that he could, he could experience all of the struggles we struggle with firsthand, and that he could actually taste death. Imagine that, that the Son of God humbles himself to become a human being, and one of the main reasons he does so is so that he can die, because otherwise he couldn't to give himself the ability to die. And yet it was essential he still be fully God so that the sacrifice of his life be sufficient for all. God died on the cross. That's a staggering statement to be able to make, isn't it? God the Son, in his human nature, died on the cross. The only substitute 
that could stand in the place of all who receive him as their saviour. And it's this truth that leads John to show us how the unintentional prophecy of Caiaphas bursts the bounds of all Jewish expectations of the Messiah. Look at what he says in verse 51. He prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and to make them one. God's saving love bursts the boundaries of Israel. It's just as Jesus declared to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of this same book, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes, brothers and sisters, the invitation is gloriously open to all, isn't it? Jesus did not just die to save the Jewish nation, He died so that God's plan of salvation might burst the bounds of Israel and reach those scattered across the world who through the centuries have put their trust in Jesus and been adopted into his family, the church. He died, according to John, not only so that we might be saved, look, but that we might be united as one. Jesus gave his life for that, that we would be united as his family. Caiaphas' intentions might have been focused on himself and his cronies and his fellow countrymen, but God intended them to herald salvation for the world. It's quite staggering, isn't it? And so listen, as we close now, I just want to make this point. Jesus was not a victim. He was not an unwilling sacrifice, you know, helpless uh, against, you know, in, in the hands of death-plotting enemies or, or the might of Rome, nor of fate, nor even of God his Father. His death was, was not like those children sacrificed to the, to the Aztec rain god, nor was it at the mercy of someone flicking a switch or pushing him over the edge. Jesus Christ laid down his own life willingly, Every gospel writer is at pains to let you know this, this staggering truth. Matthew says this when Jesus is celebrating the supper. He took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Poured out for you. Mark says, even has Jesus saying this, even the Son of Man did not come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And John has Jesus saying this, the reason my father loves me is I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Jesus was no victim. It's in this profound and one-of-a-kind act of self-sacrifice that we come face to face with the great hope of the gospel. Greater love has no man than that he lays down his life for his friends. But Paul later points out, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is indeed better for you and for me that one man die for the people than that the whole world perish. And it is my, it's my dearest prayer for each one of you here tonight that you would know him as your loving, gracious substitute and saviour. It seems like Caiaphas completely missed it, doesn't it? Missed the opportunity. Greatest opportunity of his life, missed it. Don't miss that opportunity. If you've never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, don't miss that opportunity even today. Let's pray as we close.
Father, you are the sovereign Lord. He who planned from eternity the salvation of, of your people through this, this marvellous plan, executed by your one and only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. It is in him we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of your grace, which you have lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. What a great God you are. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your willing sacrifice on our behalf to take on mortal human flesh so that you could take our place and pay for our sin. Help us. Help us to both trust in you and to proclaim this truth for the sake of your glorious name in which we pray now. Amen.